What does it mean to think well? How do you know if you are thinking well? What is the Socratic method and how has it been misused? In this episode of Dare to Think, Carrie has clipped highlights from two separate interviews discussing the relaunch of her new and improved online course, The Liberty Seminar. She explains the Socratic method in a way you've likely never heard and provides several non-academic reasons why you should brush up on these skills and replies to a few common objections. Join me, Carrie Baldwin, as we dare to think about thinking well and my new and improved Liberty Seminar. You have put together the, the Liberty Seminar. When I saw you first talking about it on Facebook and such, I had one idea, and I think after looking at it, I was, you know, not wrong, but I think it's much wider scope than what I thought it was. So I want you to frame yeah. um, what is a Liberty, Se Liberty Seminar and what are you trying to accomplish? The Liberty Seminar was actually born in 2020, and I started it for middle schoolers, high schoolers, and adults. It is teaching critical thinking using the Socratic method. Now, what I have always done is have lessons that teach the skills of critical thinking, but then we have object lessons, which is where we get to practice those skills. So previously, my classes had a particular theme for those object lessons. They might have been, you know, free market economics or principles of liberty, things like that. But what I've done now, I've, I've actually gone and revamped the, the whole thing because I, was, I, I realized I was getting a little too complicated with it. So what it is now, I've combined, I had something like 50 lessons across four different types of courses. And so what I've done is actually I've combined, I've taken the best lessons out of all of those. I've combined them into one course, which is basically a course that I'm marketing to anybody who's you know 14 or older. So if you're a teenager, you can take it. If you're an adult, you can take it. But what this does is it actually teaches you some very basic foundational things that were never never actually taught to you. So when we think of, of critical thinking, what we think about is analysis and debate and trying to take an idea and tear it apart and figure out how it's wrong and what's wrong with the person that, that came up with this idea and that sort of thing. That's what people typically think critical thinking is. And that's not it like at all. <laughs> <laughs> there is in some sense an opportunity to analyze and synthesize, but before you get to that, you have to understand the idea in the first place. Before you can say whether or not you agree with an idea or disagree with it, you have to know what is is to be understood about it. And so this is the thing that was never taught to us. We were never taught how to actually go through the process of coming to understand, learn and conceptualize an idea without analyzing it, in order to figure out what it's all about. So that is what the Liberty Seminar is supposed to do. The tagline for it is experience the freedom of thinking well. And that's really what it is. Like at the end of the day, you know, we, we talk about politics and all the things that are going on around us. And you might even be inclined to think that we're having our freedoms taken away, which I would agree with. But at the end of the day, in the final analysis, your freedom starts with you in your own mind and the way you're conceptualizing the world. And that's not to say, you know, any of this, like you can manifest things through your mind, like that's not what, what I'm talking about. But the way you react to the world is, is the thing that you have control over. And that includes your emotions, your intellectual life, your communication with others, your ability to problem solve. And those are all products of learning how to think well. So, so the lessons that are offered on my website, the Liberty Seminar, there's two different ways that you can take it. There's a self-directed course, which basically just takes you through the lessons of critical thinking itself. Okay. And then there is the sort of master course, which is the self-directed lessons plus online live seminars with me guiding you through the process of critically thinking through our object lessons. Those object lessons can be themed any way we want them to. What this new model allows me to do is really have uh, use these skills with object lessons that, that can be anything, because that's really what it's about. It's learning how to learn 
And these skills literally are the foundation for teaching yourself anything. What is the Socratic method? And what are your classes aimed at in terms of helping to teach people what it is and how to use it in real life? Right. So if anybody has heard of the Socratic method, they probably know it as a means of teaching debate skills. So it is often used in law school to teach that courtroom style debate. It is also used, there's a popular YouTuber out there named Jan Helfeld, who will try to corner people and almost embarrass them for holding political views that don't make a lot of sense. So this is how a lot of people understand what the Socratic method is. And Socrates used it in this way to a degree, but this isn't actually how he used it broadly and it's not how I use it. So Socrates used this idea of asking questions about the world around you in order to discover and learn new things. And that is how I use it. When I think of the Socratic method, I think, and this is just, you know, what I think of is basically asking questions. Mm -hmm. Now, is that essentially what it is? Learning how to ask the right questions? You know, what, you know, what, I guess when we talk about thinking, is it a matter, you know, is this inquiry a matter of like asking questions and then perceiving answers or? or So the short answer is yes, it's about asking questions. But again, think back to your education experience. You were never taught how to ask questions. And I know this because every single time I have, I, I have taught this class, even to adults, we get to the section where I'm now having you ask the questions. People get stumped. They freeze. And they think that asking questions in order to think well involves asking really convoluted, you know, wordy, long, drawn out questions as though that's what's a measure of being profound. And no, that's just your trauma response to word counts that you were assigned in high school. Okay. No, you can so when I when I when I teach this, one of the things that I do is I start with very simple questions. Now we were all taught who, what, when, where, why questions. And one of the things that I like to do is to start with those simple questions. And then what I do is I guide you through this process of diving deep into an idea, starting with a very, very basic question. Who is Socrates? Yes, it's about asking questions. It's also about responding to those questions. It's creating a dialogue between two or more people. It's recognizing that you will observe things that I don't. And so you have information to provide me that I don't have and vice versa. It is a mutual learning process. So It's easy to say, yes, it's just about asking questions and giving responses, but that doesn't, that doesn't capture it. Now, critical thinking is the ability to communicate with other people. It's the ability to think through problems and try to solve them and that sort of thing. What is lacking though, and actually you can basically Google lack of critical thinking skills in the workplace, and you'll find a ton of articles which explain how this skill, which is considered a professional soft skill, is actually in high demand because it is on the decline in the workplace. So why would this be? Well, thinking is, or rather, I should say learning, why Socrates actually used this as a means of learning. When you learn, you are thinking. But when you were in school, it was assumed that you knew how to think based on whether or not you scored well on a test, right? And scoring well on a test just means that you're good at memory recall. That's all that means. So most of us were actually never taught how to think through content that we were being taught in order to learn it. We were told what to learn, not how to learn. We were told what to think, not how to think. And then we were expected to memorize that and and regurgitate it on a test. And if we scored high, then we were good students. But most of us never actually learned how to learn. We never learned how to think. And even those people who scored well on tests were more perhaps intuitive thinkers, but they wouldn't be able to tell you what their process was for learning or thinking through those things. So what I do with my courses is I actually take my students back to foundations of learning itself. And I have broken down this learning process. Now, this isn't something that I've invented. I've 
I've borrowed from certain experts in critical thinking, including Mortimer Adler and Richard Paul and Linda Elder and Ralph Reber and Michael Strong and some other people, along with just my own experience as an independent researcher. But what I've done is I've gone through and I've broken down this learning process into basically four phases, which is general understanding, which is getting just a surface level understanding of what what the author or the lecturer or whomever intends for you to learn. And then conceptualization, which is digging deep into the ideas, then analysis, figuring out whether or not they're good ideas or valid ideas, and then synthesis, which is where you incorporate those ideas into your own. Yeah, so I've created this course to not only teach you the skills, but give you the opportunity to actually put them into practice so that you can feel the sensation of learning is thinking and, and thinking is learning and really see the systematic approach to to that learning. I mean, heck, some people say, oh, I don't remember anything that I learned in high school. Like, yeah, you don't well, learn anything. You don't remember. You probably, yeah, obviously 10 years later, what are you going to remember? But the point is probably two weeks later, you yeah. probably didn't remember what you just remembered for well, a test two weeks ago. <laughs> and it, it, it raises a really interesting question because some people have said, well, AI can learn. And I, I think that begs the question about what learning is, right? Mm. If AI can learn in your case, chat GPT should have been able to fix its error, right? Simply by having more information input. So how is a classroom full of students treated? Well, it's treated as a bunch of empty hardware that needs software installed into the brains and then check the programming to make sure that the programming or the software is installed correctly. And the way you do that is by administering a test. Right. So if you believe that's what learning is, of course you think AI can learn. But guess what? That's not what learning is. Learning is the ability to think through an idea and reason about it. And AI can't do that. And by the way, AI will never outpace the ability or the need for humans to actually reason through things. I know that people like to think of AI as being something that can supplant human reasoning, but AI is something that mirrors human reasoning. And so as long as human beings maintain the skill of learning and the skill of thinking through things, they won't be surpassed by AI. And if this skill starts to go down, AI is going to reflect that because all AI is a, is a mirror image of, of whatever it is that the programmer has, has given it yeah. instructions of. When you take this course, what I'm giving you in this course is actually breaking down this process of thinking into something you can see. Now, I try and stay stay away from the word system because it's not like every bit of thinking you do is this step one, step two, step three sort of process. There is still a process to it. It's just not... It's not like, you know, an engineer, for example, really likes to have, you know, all the ducks in the row and this yep. gear leads to this gear leads to this gear le- leads to this gear. Sure. And it's, we're glad they like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I sort of teach, I, I teach the process as though it's, as though it's steps so that you can see it. But in that process, and this is, this is part of the reason why I have the live seminars and why I encourage the live seminars over the self-directed stuff is when you are practicing this, when you are experiencing this, and I call it brain stretching, when you are experiencing the process of thinking, you're going sort of where your mind is going, but you're also trying to direct your mind in a way. So, you know, you may come to an idea and your first reaction to the idea is to analyze it. Is this a good idea? Well, I'm going to teach you how to step back and say, okay, understand the idea first. And here's the process that you can use to come to understand an idea. Right. Right. So I'll step you through that process. As you practice this, as with anything else, right, as you practice it, your brain becomes accustomed to the process and you can kind of make it your own thing. Right. When you learn how to cook a new dish from from a recipe, right, you're following a system. I need a cup of flour and I need, you know, this ingredient, that ingredient. And okay, next thing I do is turn on the oven. Okay. And right. So it steps you through a process. But once you come to learn it, you kind of create your own process. You're able to do that. So the idea with the with a class is really sort of teaching you the components or the mechanics of thinking. It is stepping you through a process, but it's not saying this is, you know, the end all be all. One of the things that I point out, if you were to plot on a chart the process of thinking and knowledge, what would that look like? Well, if you 
if you take the public schools at their word, it should be, you know, a, just sort of a, a, a straight line, maybe right. it kind of darts up and down mm-hmm. like this, but you're growing in knowledge over time. And what I, I've asked my students this question, okay, what do you think the, the thinking process is? And I get like swirls, like, you know, they, they draw out this line that's just this, this knotted mess of a line. And to some degree that that's true, but I've actually conceived of it as an infinity loop that will, that's continually moving up and down this sort of sliding scale of questions that you could be asking in your mind about any given idea. And so, you know, you may, you may come down to questions down here about implications and consequences, and you're sorting through those, which is the infinity loop. And then you realize, oh, I need more information. So you're coming back here, right? And so you're never in this situation where learning is a one and done thing, right? right. Have you ever read a book and then said, oh, that was a really good book. And then, you know, sometime later, a year later, two years later, you go back and you read the same book and you go, wow, I learned something new. Absolutely. Yeah. That's how learning works. It's never one and done. I'm taking you through that process of, of recognizing that and, and sort of seeing the system behind it. I'm wondering if you can give up an example of, or two beyond what, what we've said here in terms of ways that people, after they've started to learn this way of critical thinking and analysis and questioning, can, can use this in different areas of, of their, their life to maybe tackle different challenges or navigate different areas of, of their, their life. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the myths of critical thinking is that it's for the bookish nerds who like to be academic, like to jump into books, like to do that sort of thing. But really, that's, that's not actually true. Critical thinking is something that human beings were designed to do. But it's also a skill that has to be learned. And it's applicable in every area of life. Um, even if you're not academic or interested in books or things like that, the approach to thinking through new content and learning it can be applied, for example, with somebody like my son, who's ADHD and is very not academic, hates everything about school, but will but can learn how to fix a car and the mechanics of it and all the science behind it simply by jumping on a vehicle and learning how to do it and watching somebody else do it, right? If he takes these skills, these of asking questions in a systematic way, right? He may not be writing an essay about how to fix a car, but he's learning a necessary skill that can give him an income in the future, not just an income, but a goal and purpose in life. So it can apply for the hands-on non-academic learner. You mentioned parenting. This is something that I've used with my own kids. When you use, and I call it Socratic practice, which is a little bit more broad than Socratic Mm. method. Socratic practice is just incorporating this inquiry-based dialogue into everyday life. When you do that with your kids, what you're doing is you are creating the environment and milieu that teaches your children that you are safe to come to when they're teenagers and dealing with controversial Mm. or scary topics like, hey, mom, I just experienced pot for the first time in my life, right? Do they want to, like, as a parent, I want my kids to feel safe coming to me saying I screwed up or hey, I experienced this crazy thing that any other parent would freak out about and they need to talk through it with me, right? Yeah. They feel safe coming to me because I've already created this atmosphere of, guess what? We can talk about things and I'm not going to flip out about it and we can work through them, the issue, and arrive at conclusions and I will help you think through those things without you feeling like you're going to be in trouble for thinking through that, right? or even arriving at different conclusions than me. So from a parenting perspective, it's setting you up for a healthy relationship with your teenage and adult children. Or maybe a third way aside from academics, which we've already discussed, is simply in your professional life. This is a skill, like I said, that is on the decline in the workplace. And it has to do with the fact that it's not being, it wasn't taught to us by and large in school. And... Now it's something that employers are are looking for. The other thing I want to say, as far as application is concerned, has to do with theology and your Christian faith. One of the things that you're doing when you are thinking through an idea and even challenging it is testing the, the truthfulness and the accuracy of an idea. And you can do this with doctrine. And the reality is, that the truth stands up to scrutiny no matter how how hard you press against it. And so you can use the Socratic method to 
even increase your understanding of biblical doctrine and challenge those false doctrines or even test a doctrine to see if it's false or not and learn and grow. The reality is that our faith is not some some fanciful sentiment or emotional thing. It is very real. It is about the truth of reality and the truth of reality stands up to scrutiny. And one of the ways that you might build strength, we'll say in faith, is to test these. And actually scripture even tells us to, to, to test the spirits to know if they're from God or not, right? And so one way, in fact, it was the late Dr. R.C. Sproul from Ligonier Ministries who advocated for using the Socratic method, even in learning theology and doctrine. So that's another, uh, an, another application that I wanted to mention. I hope you're enjoying today's episode on critical thinking, and we'll get back to that in just a moment. But we want to let you know that right now, through the end of Friday, February 16th, 2024, the Liberty Seminar is open for registration. Whether you're struggling with career opportunities, a parent worried about your child having this skill for the future, or a student that feels like something is missing in your education, this is your opportunity to learn or relearn the vital skills of thinking well. To get more information and to enroll for the next Master Seminars, visit libertyseminar.com. Right, and, and they're so valuable, you know, and, and, and one might think, especially when we're talking kind of this upper, upper level kind of, kind of stuff, you know, where, where we're not talking about specifics, that, that we're talking about politics and global stuff and, and, and things are happening in our nation or our state. But really, these are skills. Like if, if you're talking about, you know, how to recognize manipulation or when you're being manipulated, I mean, that applies not just to your senator or president, but it also applies to your partner. It applies to, mm-hmm. you know, the, the people that you're dealing with on a <laughs> daily basis. And, and, right. and, and not to say that those people, you know, just it's important to recognize that and then learn how to deal with those things. Right. Well, and I have an article on my website, and this has become actually one of one of my lessons in my course, but I have an article on my website, which talks about how critical thinking is a useful response to manipulation. And that all that manipulation constitutes is a failure in in good reasoning. It's it's yeah. just chock full of logical fallacies. So if you understand manipulation is logical fallacies and you understand how to respond to those fallacies, then you know that that's how you know that critical thinking is a tool against that. In fact, there's there was an article that I read several years ago from a psychologist who had mentioned one way to heal from narcissistic abuse, for example, was critical thinking. Because what you're doing when you think is you are rewiring your brain. And that is something that's that's necessary when when you're trying to heal from that sort of abuse. Yeah. In the self-directed course, I do talk about manipulation and how that can be a problem with thinking. So even if you just take the self-directed course and not the live seminars with me, you're still going to get a lesson on manipulation. But yeah, that's true. Manipulation, and it's it's all around us. It's all around us because the vast majority of us go through our day being unreflective thinkers, mm. uh, which I just want to say, not necessarily any fault of your own. That's you know, if that's how you're raised, that's the education you got. That's <laughs> that's your normal. But you can do something about it, right? For sure. If you want to be able to understand what's happening in politics, or you want to be able to protect yourself during economic t- downturn, or you want to be able to identify and respond to manipulation, or you're just really curious about astronomy, any of those things, you have to know how to think through them. And it starts with learning how to learn. Well, one of the things I loved as I was, I was reading through your course syllabus and you have kind of the dare tos and, and mm-hmm. that implies, I think, a, a modicum of courage yes. to, to, to do that. So talk about that. Like what kind of courage, because you think about, okay, you know, the, the dare to reflect was one of, was one of the course courses on there. And, and, you know, why does it take courage to reflect or why does it cur- ha- take courage to do some to, to obtain these skills that, that are mm. important. 
Well, so this goes back to the question of what it means to critically think, right? And we've sort of been trained to think it's about criticizing some other idea or someone else who holds an idea that we disagree with. And it's not that. It's holding up a mirror to ourselves and looking at the way we think. It's thinking about our own thought life. It's thinking about the way we've conceived of ideas. And that can be very scary, right? Because <clears throat> at the end of the day, your the ideas that you hold, the beliefs that you have are a part of your identity, right? If you believe that you are safe, right, that's part of your identity. If you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and died for your sins, that's part of your identity. To hold up a mirror to those beliefs and say, are these things true? That's a challenge to your identity. So it does take courage. And I can, I, there's, there's an episode that I did with Shane Rosenthal, who actually used to be one of the producers for the White Horse Inn podcast, but now he has his own podcast called The Humble Skeptic, I think. Anyways, the episode that I did with him is titled Humble Skepticism. And one of the things that we talked about <clears throat> was how each of us had come to a point in our life, in our, our individual lives, where we had to challenge our own beliefs. And these were hardcore, basic, foundational beliefs. Now, the result of that is for us, you know, exclusively, individually, because we didn't, you know, we didn't know each other when we went through this. The result of that was that our faith was strengthened because the reality is, is that the truth holds up to scrutiny. Right. So if you hold true ideas, you can push them and press them hard and they will stand up to scrutiny. Right. And just that process can help gird your, your own faith. <clears throat> so, but it does take courage. You know, I had to, I had to face the the question or the possible reality that the way my parents raised me was wrong. Right. And that's a challenge too that's a challenge to your identity because your parents helped form your identity for good or for bad. So, so yeah, that, and, but that reflection, that being willing to look at your own thoughts and your own beliefs and ask yourself, is this true? Is the necessary first step to critical thinking? Because it's always about how well are you thinking about an idea? There is a surprisingly not unconsequential amount of, of Christians and from surprisingly different camps who have a very low view of these kind of things, of philosophy, of using things like the Socratic method or human reason and things like that. I mean, I've seen Eastern Orthodox Christians that have this kind of low view of these things. I've seen some Baptists, some Anabaptists. I've even seen like the weird hyper Calvinists who are like the presuppositionalists. And the common objection from these different groups, if I was going to boil it down to like one kind of like overarching objection, is that they say that these things are inventions of man, that they are distractions from like just divine revelation that we have in scripture. And they would say that the use of human reason actually it won't lead you towards the truth. It'll, it'll lead you away or you'll, you'll use your reason to sub, subvert the truth. They'll use the analogy of like the garden and say like, well, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if we're trying to use our knowledge and not God's knowledge, that's the same sin as the, as the garden. So what I, I think that's wrong and I could, I could give my own reasons, but I'm curious what you would say to the types of Christians who kind of, I don't know, hold their, their nose up at, at the kind of things that, that you're doing in your classes. Yeah, well, I would say, first of all, and I've already mentioned this, human beings were designed to think. In fact, I would even say that this is one of the things that differentiates humans from animals in, in, insofar as we are image bearers of God, one of those attributes is the ability to reason and think through things. So that's number one. Number two, we are, God created us to create. So of course, there are creations of man. There's lots of things that man has created that are perfectly legitimate for us to use. If that were not so, we would have to live a very primitive sort of life. Even if you were to take, say, the Amish in Pennsylvania, they've still adopted certain technologies that are creations of man, even if they haven't, you know, gone full blown into the tech, some of the technologies that, that we use today. So number one, if it's a creation of man, like that's not an argument, I would say. Number two is one of the things that, that the scripture warns against is vain and, and empty philosophies, right? 
And it's not philosophy as such. Philosophy is just a love of wisdom in one sense. In another sense, in an academic sense, it's theorizing about how the world works together or how all of the things in the world or the cosmos work together. And scripture speaks to that, right? Number one, we have a series of books in scripture that we refer to as the wisdom literature, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and I would include Job and Song of Solomon. Those are books that all have wisdom in it. And we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Mind is one of those things. We love the wisdom of God. So why would we not be lovers of philosophy, which philosophy literally means the love of wisdom. So that doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to throw it out for that reason. The other thing is that philosophy as an academic venture is about theorizing about how creation, how God's created order actually works together. And Colossians 1 speaks to that when it talks about the supremacy of Christ. It says, in Christ, all things hold together. Well, that's great. Like, awesome. That gives us a foundation from which to work from. But now we have the freedom to actually see how all of those things work together in Christ. And that's just a new opportunity to learn more about how awesome our God is. I mean, scripture even says that the created order testifies to the glory of God. Why would we not study it? So I would say for those people who have an objection to using a creation of man or using a philosophy or reasoning through things, they're not paying very close attention to scripture. There's certainly ways of thinking that we should avoid, but we're not going to know why we should avoid them or how to avoid them until we've thought through them. (laughs) So, yeah. Usually the people who are saying these types of things are doing so, I would say, more often than not because they're trying to push a false or warped understanding of scripture and they don't want you to question it. They just want no, you to say, hey, yeah. this is what the Bible says. You can't question it. This, I'm the, we're the sole interpreter of what is right. So it's, I think that's the actual reason why they have that, that they, they don't want, it's it, because their weird constructions fall apart upon scrutiny. So of course, they're going to discourage that kind of scrutiny, I think. Well, this is one reason why scripture calls us to test the spirits to know if they're yeah. from God right? Is because Jesus warned us, there are going to be false teachers and false doctrines that are intended to fool Christians, right? That's what we were warned about. So how else are we going to figure that out except to think through scripture and doctrine and what is true? And I want to also go back to pointing out Job, the story of Job. Job was, was tested himself and he challenged God, but God praised him for challenging him for challenging Mm. God in good faith, right? This wasn't like an antagonistic sort of, there's something wrong with God. It was Job saying, I know these things are true of you, but why are X, Y, and Z happening? This doesn't Mm. make sense. So Job was praised by God for challenging God and questioning him in good faith. That's excellent. Maybe some people might be concerned as they, you know, they, they see like, the Socratic method and they see some of these things and, and especially if they're from a you know a certain Christian ilk they may think, oh mm-hmm. man, is this is this gonna is this all this reasoning gonna hurt my faith? And and I think you mentioned that before and I think it's good, but but talk to me about your your story, your process, mm-hmm. how this has helped you. Well, <clears throat> I have always been naturally inquisitive for some people to an annoying point. But that natural inquisitiveness was you know, as I was growing up, was very unskilled, right? Which is probably why it became annoying for some people. Because, you know, it's like the proverbial child who always asks why, right? That can become annoying. I remember having some conversations with with my pastor at the time. This was, gosh, this was way back when I was, I was fresh out of high school. And I was asking some, some very deep questions about doctrine, And I was getting what I call the Sunday school answer, right? Which is sort of the surface level. This is all you need to know about it. I was probing more, not because I didn't believe it, but because I really wanted to understand it. Now, at the time, I didn't know I was doing anything called the Socratic method. The first time that I heard about the Socratic method was actually in a lecture from R.C. Sproul. And I really appreciated Sproul because he, I would say he thought like me in sort of a philosophical, logical way. So you can take this this methodology, for example, and apply it to scripture, apply it to your own learning of doctrine. You can take it and learn about history. You can take it and learn about science or or mathematics or ethics or literally anything. 
because all it is is a learning process. Now, as a Christian, some might say, oh, well, this is going to challenge the idea of God. No, 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 no. Remember what I said. The truth holds up to scrutiny, right? So it makes sense that false gods would not hold up to the scrutiny of the Socratic method. It does not make sense that the one true God would not hold up to the scrutiny of the Socratic method. So that's something to remember. At any rate, so that's when I first heard about the Socratic method. It didn't really come back around to me. Think of that infinity loop. It didn't really come back to me and hit me as a methodology as such until I got my degree in philosophy, which was I, I got that degree in 2015. Okay. And then it clicked. And I was like, oh, this is what I've been doing <laughs> in a very unskilled way. And right. oh, there's an actually there's actually a skilled way to do it. So I ended up using this this method with my own kids in homeschooling. Now, there are other subjects that maybe one loves that doesn't require that because <clears throat> you spend all of your time thinking about it and you spend mm -hmm. all of your time. And so is, is this process that you teach uncorking that for other aspects of your life? Because it is something we do naturally, you know, if yeah. for something that we're passionate about, you know, if, if, if I'm in love with a, with a lady, I'm thinking about her all the time and I'm thinking about, you know, like it, it's, right. it's all about her. And so, you know, but, but uncorking that in other aspects, I think is, is <laughs> the difficult <Yeah>. part. <laughs> so he here's the thing. And this is why there's, there's a movement towards self-directed learning for kids, right? Is because when you are interested in something, you are going to pursue it just naturally. You will intuitively think through that thing that you're interested in simply because you're interested in it. Now, intuitive thinkers, and I would say I'm, I'm an intuitive thinker, intuitive thinkers, what they would get, what they would, well, first of all, intuitive thinkers can kind of go through life and consider themselves good thinkers just simply because they're quite intuitive about it and they're pretty good at it just naturally. Okay, so those people exist. The benefit to taking a course like this is that you're still turning that mirror on yourself and thinking about your own thinking and then coming to a conscious awareness of what that process is for you, right? And that is still, no matter what, the next step to improving your own thinking skills. Even if you're an intuitive thinker, being conscious and aware of that process that's happening, even with those, those things that you're interested in, only improves your ability to think. And the other thing I want to say, and this sort of touches back on your, on your question about the Socratic method being simply about asking questions. Once you learn how to ask questions, you can ask them strategically, right? So there's a series of questions that I teach you that help you get just a general level of understanding of an idea, right? You come across a book, for example, and you're not sure if you want to read it or not, you've got to get some level of understanding of the book in order to decide if it's something you're interested in, right? This is true of, you know, kids who are exploring, you know, subjects that they like or dislike. You have to come to a, a general understanding. So I teach you these strategic questions for coming to a general understanding of an idea or a book or whatever. So you can decide if you want to pursue it or not. Right. And then you've got questions to help you that strategize the process of conceptualization, actually holding that idea in your mind and learning every facet of it and figuring it out. And then you have questions that are strategic towards analysis and figuring out, is it a good idea? Is, is the way I'm thinking about it correctly? Correct. And then you have strategic questions for synthesis. How do you actually incorporate that into the ideas that you that already exist in your head? Right. So whether you're an intuitive thinker or you're an unreflective thinker, you have an opportunity to improve your skills by becoming conscious and aware of your thought life and then learning to ask questions in a strategic way so that you are intentionally learning things about the world. And that's powerful. That's good. Thank you for listening to Dare to Think. This is the official podcast of my website, nearliberty.com. There you can find my other episodes, interviews, and articles which seek to challenge and rethink prevailing paradigms. If you like what you heard today and would like to get access to premium content, please consider becoming a monthly member. 10% of every monthly membership will go directly to Let Them Live, 
a nonprofit aimed at relieving financial hardship for women considering abortions so that they will change their minds and choose life. For as little as $5 a month, you can get early access to all new content, monthly research updates, and a commenter profile so you can interact with me and other members on articles and episodes. Become a premium member and unlock even more benefits. You can find that information at nearliberty.com slash membership and click on monthly memberships to learn more. And please do leave a review of Dare to Think on Apple and YouTube and follow me on Facebook and Twitter.